Good evening, everybody, and uh, I'm very happy to be uh, back actually here in Maastricht. I've been here before. Um, I'm also very pleased to see such a huge crowd here and also with very diverse backgrounds and ages. I assume that the younger half are probably primarily interested in the Silicon Valley half of my talk in the older part in this in the welfare state part but we'll try to make it exciting for uh, for both of you so uh, let me just say uh, a few words about why I actually have arrived at this critique of Silicon Valley and also why I start looking at the political and economic dimensions of the welfare state because it's not obvious why somebody with my profile who was born and raised in Belarus and then uh, went to live in the United States uh, where I still am based and publish most of my work, why would I be the person talking about the welfare state to begin with? I mean, neither Belarus nor the United States are particularly well known for being uh, very generous welfare states. Uh, so uh, much of it has to do with how my own thinking on technology and the role that technology companies play in our life today uh, has evolved. Uh, as you've heard, uh, coming from Belarus, I began my career working for an NGO uh, that uh, had in retrospect now, I think, rather utopian beliefs about the power of digital technologies and digital platforms to affect political change. I spent three years or so traveling very actively in the former Soviet Union, partly in the Middle East, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, working with activists, bloggers, uh, politicians, mostly in the opposition, training them and preaching them the wonders of new media about 10 years ago, seven years ago or so. Um, and uh, what I discovered in that work is that a lot of the assumptions that we had about the transformative and positive and emancipatory uh, transformational potential of new technologies, they were rather naive and there were a lot of trends on the ground, um, particularly as governments uh, that we were uh, trying to somehow make weaker, and we're talking about authoritarian regimes here, they were becoming very sophisticated at exploiting the same technologies for their own purposes and for their own goods, whether it had to do with the use of these platforms and technologies for spreading propaganda, whether it had to do with using these technologies and platforms for surveillance or for cyber attacks. There were quite a lot of unexpected uses for technology that us enthusiasts didn't see. And that uh, early uh, message that I got from my very early work, uh, since I left college, in fact, uh, was precisely this, that it's very easy to get excited and get carried away by the promise of many of these technologies while the actual long-term effects will only be visible uh, after a period and they will not necessarily be as emancipatory as uh, most of us expected. But what I have noticed in that early work that I was doing uh, was that Silicon Valley, uh, and you know that was the time when people started talking about Silicon Valley as an actor. You might now accept it as a given, but seven, eight years ago, we didn't really talk about Silicon Valley as an actor in the same way as we now talk about Wall Street, for example. Right? It's something relatively new, something relatively recent, which to me underscores this uh, gradual migration of power from places like Washington, places like Brussels, places like Wall Street, to a new place in California, and that being Silicon Valley. So what I noticed is that Silicon Valley itself was becoming increasingly a source of hope and aspiration for a lot of politicians, especially when it came to foreign policy. This is the world out of which I was coming. After all, I was coming from the world of you know, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, the former USSR, where the uh, issues on the table uh, were about democracy, human rights, freedom of expression, and the ways in which digital media could somehow amplify and accelerate some of these processes of emancipation. So there was a lot of hope back to the likes of Facebook and Google and Twitter 
with regards to making it easier for dissidents, social movements, politicians in the opposition, journalists to communicate, mobilize, and so forth. So the assumption was that as these companies, be it Facebook, Google, Twitter, Amazon, keep spreading their activities around the globe, uh, we would somehow enter a very different paradigm, a world where there will be more democracy, human rights, freedom of expression, and so forth. And I think that there is a reason why so many American politicians found it so inspiring and so attractive, because it basically allowed them to tell this very appealing story that essentially the global success and the global spread of American capitalism could also usher in a new stage of democracy, in part because we will, for the first time, be seeing these American companies that are not just exporting conflict or you know, instability when it comes to you know, political change or all of the traditional negative things that we expect from big multinationals, but they would actually be ushering in uh, something positive. Right? communication, access to information, and so forth. So by 2011 or so, I would say that in Washington at least, uh, there emerged a certain political and uh, geopolitical bubble where a lot of people in the administration at the time thought that somehow Silicon Valley would be uh, a nice ally in helping to spread uh, some of the democratization agenda uh, that uh, some people in Washington were actually quite serious about pursuing. Uh, I was, from the very beginning, uh, rather skeptical of that agenda, and I can explain why if you want now during the Q&A, but for me that signified for the first time in history, uh, at least, this uh, tendency to look at these technology companies as a source of solutions that were previously unavailable. It was something like a magic wand that can suddenly help to democratize the Middle East, or help to democratize Central Asia, to usher in new protests in Latin America, and so forth. A lot of people in Washington, in the policymaking circles, were looking to Silicon Valley for solutions. Right? And this is where some of my early work and early critique of solutionism, this is where it comes from. Right? It comes from this exposure to a lot of rather hopeful uh, projects that did think that somehow Google and Facebook, as they keep spreading around the globe, will eventually result in more democracy. Right? So the assumptions made by a lot of foreign policymakers in the State Department and elsewhere in America, but also increasingly in Europe, was that somehow we can actually enroll Silicon Valley in this process of spreading democracy. And somehow the fact that they are business models involve collection of data, they involve facilitation of communication, that in itself will help us undermine the rigid control over the public sphere that a lot of authoritarian governments are holding in their countries. So uh, having arrived at that insight, that Silicon Valley was seen increasingly as an ally by governments in the field of foreign policy, I started looking at other domains uh, in my second book, and I saw that I uh, detected very similar uh, reasoning and very similar explanation and motivation and uh, basically reasons attributed as to why Silicon Valley will be a very useful ally when it comes to fighting other problems. Whether those problems have to do with energy consumption, whether they have to do with health, whether they have to do with things like obesity, uh, fighting obesity for example, whether they have to do with crime prevention, they seem to be a new kind of discourse, a new kind of rhetoric emerging, which basically uh, granted Silicon Valley um, this ability and this uh, basic uh, possibility to get engaged in social issues and thus transform them, hopefully for the better, as a result of the natural operation, as a result of the natural business model which revolves around data collection. Right, and I'll just walk you through a few examples just to explain uh, what I have in mind here. Right? So if you think about the utility of a company like Google or Facebook to very basic project like fighting terrorism or fighting crime, I mean, I think this is one area that we all grasp almost intuitively. And there, the assumption is very simple. The assumption is that as these companies offer communication services, they end up collecting and centralizing a lot of data. So it makes it easier for uh, the NSA, 
national security agencies of other countries, the police, to basically get access to the data and then carry on investigations. If you push that uh, logic a step further, you can also see how you can use this data not just to trace individual connections between individuals whom they're coordinating with, the kind of stuff you see in uh, you know, films about drug lords where the police is trying to investigate how they're communicating as with whom, you can actually move also to a more advanced level where you are trying to analyze a lot of data about behavior, about specific individuals, regions, parts of the city in order to predict when crime might happen next. Right? That's a very big and growing area called predictive policing and it basically revolves around the logic of collecting as much data as you can about anybody building sophisticated systems for our analysis and prediction and thus being able to reallocate your police force in a way uh, where police cars and police go to only the areas where crime is likely to happen most based on some prior statistical models and based on the actual data that comes in. Right? The police, of course, is more than happy to get access to these technologies, but it would be almost impossible for them to collect this data on its own. Right? But the world that we are entering now has this rather useful ally and its companies represented by Silicon Valley who have it as part of their business model to basically centralize, collect and analyze as much data as possible. Not just about your individual communications like email or search, but also increasingly about what various objects you might be using in your house are doing. Right? So they would like to analyze your smart thermostat, they would like to analyze, in the case of Google, they bought Nest, uh, the smart thermostat. They might want to analyze what's happening in your smart car, smart refrigerator, smart bath, you, you name it. Virtually everything now that is capable of having some kind of a sensor in a screen built into it would be, uh, uh, you know, there would be a label smart attached to it, which basically means that it's generating some data, which then can be used for some purposes, right? And you have entire companies like Google, which are now building operating systems, which will allow them to integrate data coming from various smart objects into just one pile, thus collecting as much of it, and thus that data becomes useful for all sorts of predictions, including those of the police, right? Uh, of course, one of the sort of invisible effects here that is not perceived by many people is that if we actually had full, uh, fully competitive environment where you didn't have one centralized actor like Google grabbing all this data, the work of many of these agencies would be much harder to conduct for the sole reason that they will need to talk to 20 different providers of services and not just one. So there is a very interesting here connection that I think we should reflect on as I keep on talking about the connection of monopolies. And I would argue that when it comes to data, Google is a data monopoly and the national security state, whereby the work of the national security state, and you can also apply a similar model to thinking about predictions in the field of health, or in the field of energy, they are made much easier by the fact that this market's actually not very competitive and you just have one company that collects all the data and that makes it available and useful to whatever agency wants to use it. In a truly decentralized market, which is uh, a market where, you know, one company does email, but another company does search, and yet another company does your smart thermostat, and yet another company does your smart car, it will be very hard to engage in the kinds of violations of privacy that the National Security Agency in the US is famous for. So there is this very interesting connection between monopolization on the one hand and the ability to make predictions out of that data, which I think we have to keep in mind. So uh, while we understand how this reasoning works in the case of fighting crime or predicting crime or tracking uh, you know, terrorists or criminals, I mean, even there, by the way, you can think of ways in which uh, it's not really a way to fight crime, it's a way to fight the effects of crime, right? Which is a critique that is often made uh, about big data and I will show how some of that applies and what effects it has when you think about health, but basically what we are doing here, if we think that data allows us to predict when crime or terror might happen next, what we are doing is basically mitigating the effects of crime or terror, right? It's a very basic insight, but uh, uh, you know, you can see how powerful it might be uh, in misleading us as to our own ability to handle the situation with all this data. 
I mean, if you think about how the U.S. administration, for example, is uh, conducting uh, its drone warfare in the Middle East, you'll clearly notice that you know the way in which uh, they are trying to prevent terror conducted by some radicalized young people in Yemen. It's not necessarily by asking why on earth they would like to blow up an airplane. It's by collecting and creating a database that will rank all young people in Yemen based on their propensity and likelihood to blow up an airplane, right? And then once you have the database, you can do the scoring and the ranking and then just keep those dangerous people out without necessarily, you know, send drones to get rid of them, without necessarily asking any of the causal questions as to how likely that your own drone policy and drone warfare might actually help to radicalize them even further, right? So this kind of causal reasoning that for me used to mark our thinking about politics in the Western world and politics in general is kind of increasingly downgraded in uh, favor of a very different approach to political life, which is not necessarily based on any search for causality or causal models as to why problems exist and persist, uh, but only in terms of mitigating their effects. So you kind of take the existence of problems for granted because your ability as a policymaker or as a community or as a police to do anything about those problems is either constrained or non-existent, and instead you deploy technology in order to fight the effects of those problems. And you can basically see how the same rationale of fighting the effects instead of fighting causes applies in many other domains where we have access to advanced information technologies and a lot of data. And I think that health, in a sense, it's probably a very good example. Again, if you look to America, and I, I also want to warn you that I don't think that what I'm saying applies to America only in part because there are a lot of proposals, even at the level of the European Commission, which are basically inspired by the developments that are happening in California. So I would strongly uh, argue against this uh, kind of vision of cultural and economic and political exceptionalism that a lot of people in Europe still have, thinking that all of those changes are just happening in California or maybe London, but they're not going to sweep aside Berlin or Amsterdam. I mean, it's going to happen if it's not already happening, in part because there are people in various European institutions and governments that are making this vision happen. So this is just a footnote uh, about the geographic scope of this. But if you look at some of the uptake of the apps for fighting, sort of improving your health in America. What are those apps about? For the large part, they're apps focused on uh, fighting obesity, right? And for me, this is actually a very good example of both the kind of reasoning that's implicit in this um, attempts to resolve a problem, uh, but it also shows you how important of an ally Silicon Valley and technology companies are to our new policymakers who are armed with a very particular toolkit, mostly emerging out of behavioral economics, uh, which goes about changing the world, or at least trying to mitigate some of the uh, effects of the problems that we have. So just to, to, to get this out of the way, what do those apps do? For the most part, and many of you are probably using them, so I don't even have to go into detail, those apps do very basic things. They measure various activities about you and your daily life. They measure how much you walk, they measure how much you sleep, they measure how much you exercise, you know, with some advancement and advanced sensors uh, in your physical environment, but also in your technologies and phones, you can clearly see how they can measure the caloric intake of the foods you're consuming, and you can basically measure your emotional responses to things. I mean, there are all sorts of things that can be done. I mean, police in Dubai now are tracking whether people are happy or not based on, uh, uh, you know, the emotional responses to various gadgets and technologies. I mean, the sky is the limit here. As the sensors get better, there are more and more things that can be tracked and analyzed. When it comes to health and obesity, I mean, you can focus on just a few indicators, how much you walk, how much you exercise, and what you eat. And based out on that, uh, you can come up with some kind of a very basic input-output model where you basically say, well, the reason why certain problems develop and occur, in this case, obesity, uh, the level of the individual, is because, well, you probably don't exercise enough and you eat a lot of crappy food. So the suggestion that you're being given is that, well, you have to exercise more and you have to start eating healthy and you have to, you know, sleep better and so forth and so forth, right? And uh, there is nothing particularly wrong with those suggestions, but it wouldn't take you very long to notice that all of them work 
at one particular level of problem solving. All of them revolve around interventions done by individuals as you can even say consumers in the marketplace of food exercise services and whatnot, they're not really being uh, carried out at the level of the polity, at the level of the community, at the level of the nation state, at the level where you can actually intervene in a way that will uh, change the situation beyond just tinkering with the individual citizen. Right? So in a sense, uh, the data that we are gathering with all those sensors in our devices and so forth, this is mostly data about our own individual behavior. Right? And it's based on analysis of the data and then we make the interventions. But in some sense, from a policy perspective, and even more from the political perspective, it's very low-hanging fruit. Because if you actually come up with a complex model and a complex rationale as to why certain problems like obesity, or you, know, you pick any other health problem, why they exist, you'll clearly see that there are quite a lot of people in communities who would come up with a much more complex picture of the world where they would try to allocate blame, not just on the shoulders of the citizens, but they would also involve, and perhaps much more so, uh, big uh, you know, food companies, junk food companies, they will involve uh, pharmaceutical companies, they will involve uh, maybe even, you know, in America, city planners who build cities in a way that you don't actually get a chance to walk and you need a car, uh, you know, you can't actually go that easily to an organic food market and buy healthy food because that requires having a car and if you are not necessarily a middle class person and you don't have a car, you will not be able to get it. So you can clearly see how there are certain class issues even and economic issues and social issues that uh, clearly are present in making a problem like obesity into a problem that it is. What's happening uh, as we delegate more and more responsibility for problem solving to Silicon Valley is that there is clearly very little that Silicon Valley can or wants to do about uh, the food industry or about the pharmaceutical industry or about how you know, our cities are designed or about our reliance on the car and so forth. There is very little money to be made and the interventions that that would require are relatively ambitious and difficult. So what we end up with are interventions that function solely at the level of the citizen so that more and more responsibility for our own well-being, resilience, and you name it, uh, is put onto our own shoulders. Right? But here as well, I would argue that we are seeing a substitution of the logic of causality that I've described in the previous example with the logic of effects. Uh, where we are fighting really the effects of a problem like obesity on us, we are not getting fatter, but we are not really fighting anywhere close to its root causes. Right? And uh, I would argue that, I mean, I will get to the Silicon Valley in a second, but I would argue that this vision of the world whereby structural, social, and political constraints and actors do not really register, and they are not really there to be fought, uh, coincides rather well with the kind of unambitious, extremely uh, neoliberal vision that a lot of our governments have, including governments in Europe, which are more than happy to basically place as much responsibility as possible for their own well-being now on the shoulders of the citizens while living corporations uh, and other players who have previously been registered at least or they registered as part of our social and political discourse leaving them untouched right and you can then you know we can make all sorts of extrapolations but any one of you who has read it's, I looked at some of the leaked drafts of the transatlantic treaties, trade treaties that Europe is now negotiating with America, we'll see that the attitude that many of the treaties take towards corporations uh, is a rather uh, lax one, right? It, corporations are there to sue states, not the other way around, right? So there is a certain um, uh, familiarity or similarity at play here. And I would argue that this uh, pursuit of politics solely through the vehicle of the citizen aligns really well with how our neoliberal governments would like to conceive of the world, right? And it's a world that is marked by a profound sense of what I would call epistemic asymmetry in a sense that citizens are becoming more and more transparent as more and more data is being collected about us because we're using all the services, platforms, and so on, but all of the other players are becoming less and less so. 
corporations are becoming less transparent because, I mean, many of them are actually funding their own studies to distort science, so we actually know less and less about the real effect on the world. Uh, governments are becoming less and less transparent because they are outsourcing more and more of their services to corporations who are not actually even part to most of the freedom of expression laws. Uh, there are such processes that are happening that are basically introducing more and more obscurity into the work of the other players while the citizens themselves are becoming much easier to govern, uh, monitor, and manipulate, right? And it's in this environment that Silicon Valley can present itself as a savior because even for our politicians, it's becoming increasingly harder to deny the existence of problems. Right? It will be very hard to deny the existence of obesity in the US or even in the UK now. It will be very hard to deny the existence of climate change. It will be very hard to deny the existence of terrorism. I mean, the world is not getting safer, better, or you know, healthier by any possible means, at least not in Western Europe or North America. Uh, and yet, those problems cause huge concern for corporations, governments, and many other players. So they have to be addressed somehow. Right? So governments are not solving them because they're benevolent. Governments have to solve them because you don't want to end up with a population who will drain even more resources out of your welfare system and thus will be unable to work. Right? So, I mean, there are very pragmatic concerns that are faced by governments. Uh, and it's in this environment where Silicon Valley was its business model that does revolve around collecting data and analyzing it, present itself as some kind of benevolent savior. Of, uh, of the West, but also of the uh, Western European, I would argue, much more than American uh, model. What I mean by this is uh, the following. Uh, if you think about how we thought that privatization of everything would end 20 or 30 years ago, just as Margaret Thatcher got in power you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, Ronald Reagan was also very powerful in the US, and there have been many changes also happening in Europe since then, which are hard to deny that there has been a systematic effort to put more of public and previously free infrastructure and services into the hands of companies that's privatizing it and making it more expensive from education to health to welfare to pensions. You know, you know the effects of this in Holland uh, also quite well. Uh, what we thought, if you were to ask the question about the ultimate effects of this, not to the neoliberal uh, uh, sort of elite that was enacting them, but to the citizens and the critics of those programs, if you were to ask them 20 or 30 years ago, how do you think all of these programs will end? You would get a very dystopian picture, and that dystopian picture will go something like this. Well, as everything gets privatized, everything will become more expensive. So suddenly you'll have to pay for, for education, you'll have to pay for health, you'll have to pay for transportation, insurance, and so forth. To some extent, uh, this is definitely happening, and it will probably even get worse in some respects. I mean, if you look at the world of insurance, uh, I can assure you that there is nothing in the world of insurance uh, that will get better as more sensors can track your behavior. Like, there is no way that you will end up uh, having a less, um, uh, sort of a more just system as sensors proliferate under the current political and economic conditions because the use of sensors and the data that they generate right now is to make predictions about your behavior, right? And we can see very well how it ties with the insurance industry because the insurance industry does want to know uh, in the long run whether you know the cup of coffee you're deciding to consume today will affect or not the possibility that you will get some kind of a heart condition. Right? So, I mean, they're very interested to know that. And if there was a way for them to track all the cups of coffees that you're drinking, uh, they will be able to basically set their rates in a manner that will be much more personalized. Right? So those of us who, again, are healthier than the average do probably stand to benefit. In that sense, I deliberately use the words more just and more fair and not necessarily uh, more expensive because those of us who are already healthier will probably benefit from this new system whereby you know all of my own consumption will be monitored and I'll be paying based on my consumption, my health, my exercise level and not on some generalized version of the world that also counts my neighbor who is lazy and doesn't want to exercise and eats a lot of unhealthy food. 
right? But this kind of view of the world where there are those lazy people that, you know, our neoliberal leaders like to tell us about, that was also a view of the world that did have some solidarity left in it, right? I mean, the assumption was that perhaps I would not be able to um, be charged uh, exactly what I need to be charged, but that would also enable certain people who might have certain problems in their life uh, get an extra chance, right? And perhaps succeed in a way that they wouldn't get that chance under the new system. You can clearly see how this new highly personalized system whereby sensors can determine or at least adjust the exact rates that you'll be paying for everything from your car insurance to your health insurance to you name it, as we are especially moving from the generalized insurance in Europe. You can clearly see how even that system, again, can only think in terms of individual responsibility and individual history. Because even there, the assumption is that you have health problems only because you're lazy and not because you come from a certain social and economic class where you cannot afford necessarily to buy the healthiest food around. Right? Even there, there is a basic denial of the social nature of many problems that we have, where all of the social nature of the problems that we have is again converted into individual natures. So again, we're being told that every single difficulty and challenge that we have in life is not the product of history, deep historical forces, class struggle, discrimination, you name it, but it's just the failure of you, the individual, to be as responsible as you should have been. Right? But this is just one part. This is sort of the, the ugly, nasty part that I think is very easy for us to arrive at if you spend any time thinking or even looking at what some of the insurance companies do now. I mean, I don't know how far the system, how far spread the system is in Europe now. In America, I can go and get a sensor, install it in my car, drive around for six months, bring the data to my insurance company, prove that I'm a safer driver than they assume in their spreadsheets, and thus I'll end up paying less for my insurance. Right? I mean, again, those incentives are already built and offered into the system itself. Right? I'm not necessarily concerned about car insurance here, but if you start thinking how that would apply to things like health, you know, it gets a bit creepy. But that, I think, is a very basic thing to figure out. This is not what I'd like to focus on. What I'd like to focus on is something else, and that's this assumption that somehow with privatization and neoliberalism, things will continue getting more expensive as they get privatized. What Silicon Valley shows, and they have shown it first time uh, with privatization of telecommunications infrastructure, right, is that they can actually offer quite a lot of services for free, or most of the services for free, and then charge for a select few on top of them, in a way that a lot of our states currently cannot. If you think about you know, who underwrites, in some way or another, your fantastic use of information search or uh, email, basic forms of communication, you know, the old system that we develop in Europe under welfare policies and before was very different. The assumption there was that, you know, you need some information, you go to a publicly funded library and there is somebody there who will find it for you. Who was paying for that service? It was you who was paying for it with your taxes. Right? The assumption was that you will be creating these public institutions that will be financed by us and uh, thus, they will not necessarily have any temptations and any biases to experiment with alternative models of funding that might compromise privacy or other things in the meantime. I mean, if we were really setting up a modern post office today, I can assure you that there will be a giant lobby uh, participating in this debate who will be saying that the system with stamps, it's, I mean, I don't know how many of you have used stamps. I mean, it's a very young uh, audience, but, you know, <laughs> used to send letters by putting stamps on the envelopes. Um, so, uh, you know, I can assure you that if you were to mention this idea that you can buy stamps and put them on an envelope, they will tell you, well, but this is crazy. We can, it would be better off if we just put somebody from some giant advertising firm in the post office, they'll open every letter, scan the text, insert the flyer into it, and that will pay for the letter. I mean, essentially, this is what Google does, right? They open every letter. I mean, they don't read it manually, but there are computers that read it, and they insert an ad into it, and this is what pays for the service. The same thing happens with your Google search. It's not you paying taxes to a library in order to get you know, before the war on terror started, libraries were actually very anonymous places 
they wouldn't know what you were reading. You would come and read it in your own privacy, your own good, explore dangerous ideas, whatever. Like that was a very different way to fund a service. Right? What has happened, and first it happened as information services, is that Silicon Valley has figured out that as long as they can infer and monitor what it is that you do with um, their service, they will find a way to extract value from it by essentially linking it to the global advertising market. So as you're writing an email or as you're doing a Google search, in the background there is a giant machinery that's working to match uh, your content with a supplier of services that wants to advertise those services somewhere and uh, Google's uh, magic algorithm matches supply and demand, there is an auction in the background, money is being made, somebody pays for a service. Right, this is the new model. But uh, what happens is that Google, of course, at this point, uh, started with search and started with uh, email by historical coincidence. It didn't start with search or email because they thought that you know, this is where most data is. I mean, there are many other domains where data is generated. You know, if you put enough sensors into those domains, you can generate and harvest quite a lot of data. You know, you drive your car, data is generated not just about where you're driving, it's also generated about what other cars are doing. It's generated about the traffic in the city. It's generated about how far, how slow, uh, how fast the cars are moving. Right? There is a lot of data generated, it's just that previously it was very hard to capture it. Right? Now that you have sensors into every car, and now that you actually have the ability to tie that data with other data that you have generated, you can think of entirely new business models that will allow you to basically provide a lot of services at a rate that will be much cheaper, or perhaps it will even be free, yes? while at the same time, essentially having advertising or some other service that most advertising pay for their provision. Right? And if you understand where I'm going with this, you can clearly see how the ability to gather data about our exercise levels, our sleeping patterns, our uh, eating patterns, uh, our energy consumption patterns, virtually every single thing that we do now can be captured in one way or another, which also means that Silicon Valley can uh, miraculously pop up and say that, well, let us provide that service and we'll provide it for free as long as you let us uh, stick with the same deal and the same terms as you let us stick when we were providing email and search. Right? And what were the terms with email and search? I mean, most of us think that it's a relatively innocuous innocent transaction. We go online, we search for something, some data is generated in the meantime, Google serves an ad on it, data is gone, that's it. I think that this is a very naive view to conceive of how the world works. We actually have to be able to trace where value is generated, what value data that we generate in the context of conducting a Google search or sending an email, what value the data has, and they have to understand how Google manages to keep growing by incorporating that data. It, which also means that it might be true that we're actually generating more value for Google in the long term by using its services than Google is generating for us, uh, for itself, by, and for us, well, for itself through advertising and for us by offering those services. Right? And I think this is a very important point that you, that, that you have to grasp, that every time we use a Google service, there is an extra piece of data that's added somewhere in its database that is worth much more that we could currently account for if we just look at our use of those particular services. Because a lot of these things we do, they also involve a social dimension. So you know, every email I send is not just a data point about me, it's also a data point about somebody to whom I'm addressing my email. Right? Even that creates an additional data point there about the person who's my addressee. Right? If I'm sending an email to 10 people, right, you can clearly see that I'm generating value uh, and data that's valuable, not just about me, but also about 10 other people right, who are in a connection with me. Right? Uh, and I think this is just one of the examples that will show you that there is something that's not right about the way in which we account and price data right now. And that uh, some developers and entrepreneurs, even in Silicon Valley, have understood it. So the battle that we are having right now is on two fronts. On the one hand, you have the likes of Google and Facebook who are basically saying, data, forget about it, it's not very important. 
Data is something that we do and we take and we know how to make best use of it, so just let us harvest even more of it. So this is the data monopoly path, right? And the argument made by these companies is that they have such a huge scale and they have such a giant uh, server infrastructure that they're actually the only ones who can possibly make sense and analyze all the data. Right? And in that sense, we should just continue where we are right now, feeding even more data into their servers, and eventually some good will come out. Right? And for me, a very good example of this is a service that Google launched a few years ago, which I actually think will be its flagship service, perhaps even be on search. And many of you already have it on your smartphones. If you use smartphones from Android, it's uh, the Google Now service. So those of you who don't know how it works, uh, it's very simple. It basically monitors everything that you do on different Google services like search, Gmail, YouTube, news, and so forth. And now it's also integrated with third-party apps. So the music you listen to on Spotify, the places you visit on Airbnb is also integrated in Google Now. And the way it works is that every time something new happens, an event happens, Google detects something in your inbox, you get a notification on Google Now. So Google Now, for example, I use it, you know, I confess for experimental purposes. Um, I use it and I travel a lot. So every time there is an email arriving with my plane reservation, Google Now already knows that I'm about to get on a plane. It puts it on my calendar automatically and it informs me that I have a plane coming up tomorrow. So it basically works as a virtual assistant of sorts, right? And this is exactly how Google is pitching it to the public. There is... Um, but there are many other features, right? It looks at the weather in the cities where you travel, you know, if it knows that it might rain, it will, you know, alert you, you need to take an umbrella, it tracks how much exercise you do, how much walking you do at the end of every month, it will show you that if you've enabled certain geolocational features, it will tell you, well, this month you've walked, uh, you know, 20,000 steps and perhaps it's 10% lower than the last month, right? It does all of that analysis in the background and Google is integrating more and more sources of data into it. So every time, you know, I am somewhere in a big city and I'm standing next to an art gallery, Google now will tell me, well, there is a particular painting in that gallery that is worth seeing. I should really go there, right? And it knows it because I have shown some interest in art and it knows that I'm in that city. It uh, leverages its system of sensors to basically tell me what kind of information I might be needing at this particular time. If you think about the logic of this, it's actually, it's very deep. It actually undercuts and almost cannibalizes on Google's own core service, which is search, because it makes search relevant. I no longer need to go to a search engine and say, you know, show me weather in Maastricht. I no longer need to go to a search engine and say, show me all the paintings in this particular museum, you know, in Amsterdam or somewhere else. All of that is done automatically. And all of that is done not based on some universalistic consumption about here's a guy in Maastricht. It's done based on me and on my profile, which Google has aggregated and collected based on the data that they have gathered about me over the last 10 years. Right? Which basically means that we are moving from this idea of search to a world of autonomous search where Google searches things for us in the background based on the things we have done searched in the past and it feeds us that information as Google thinks we need it. Right? Which has all sorts of competitive aspects to it because for me basically it means that any European policymaker that thinks that Google operates in a competitive market is out of their mind because clearly it's not the fact that Google has superior algorithms that makes it so hard to disrupt and displace right now. It's the fact that they're sitting on 10 years worth of user data and it's that data which makes them so powerful in making those predictions. You can be the next Steve Jobs and spend your entire lifetime living in some garage and you will still not build the next Google because it's not a matter of an algorithm at this point. It's a matter of the giant system that involves all the sensors that are feeding into the system. And here I'm talking not just about, you know, email, I'm also talking about smart cars, smart thermostats, and you name it. And I'm also talking about all the data that they have accumulated so far. But the pitch that Google is making, and I think they're not stupid. I mean, the pitch that they're making is that it's good to leave all the data with them because as we leave more data with them, they will be able to provide these fantastic services like Google Now. When you can think about the implications of a service like Google Now for health or energy. Right? Because again, as they're incorporating more data, 
beyond just your email and your search, the kinds of predictions and guidances and nudges and you know the, the, the rise of behavioral economics here is not accidental that Google will be able of provide will be able to provide will be immense, right? And Google knows how to frame it and how to pitch it, so they're pitching it as a new kind of mobility for people who previously could not afford the kinds of help that comes from all these tools. So they're actually pitching it as some kind of prototypical, if not welfare state, then welfare assistance. So if you go and listen, for example, to Google's chief economist, Hal Varian, who's a very prominent economist in his own right, he will tell you that basically what Google uh, now is doing with information technology is basically offering to the poor people and to the you know uh, people in the lower uh, sort of in, in, in the lower classes the ability to get access to all of the goods that the rich people already have. So in five or ten years, if you extrapolate from that logic, the poor people will have what the rich people have now, which means that you wouldn't need to have a chauffeur because your car will be driving on its own. Right? So forget about chauffeurs, you'll just have the chauffeur delivered through technology. Forget about 10 personal assistants who make up your calendar and book all your travel, Google now will do it. Right? And they make the same kind of claims, which are not in any way inaccurate, because Google now does save you a lot of time. So in some sense, it is a means of social advancement. I can clearly understand why a lot of people will be using this service. Because if you are a busy person who has to support their family and has to work maybe more than one job and has to go to the you know, babysitter and whatnot, yes, it is very helpful. It does the kinds of things that a personal assistant would do for you. Right? But that in itself presupposes and requires your complete surrender uh, to the system. So it creates a dependency whereby you actually want to feed even more data into the system because the more data you feed into the system, the better the predictions and assistance will be. Right? Which means that you can forget about whatever laws we are passing on data protection and privacy in Europe because the economic incentives for individual citizens are structured in such a manner that it's actually to our advantage to be as self-disclosing as possible because the more we self-disclose, the more benefits we reap from those projects. Right, which, again, uh, here there is a proper political analysis to be made because it's not just that they are technological platforms. I mean, those are giant corporations, some of the biggest in the world. And, and it's a particular relationship between the citizens and corporations, partly mediated by governments, that has to concern us here. But, you know, I mentioned that there are two options. I would like to explain also what the other option currently on the table is. But let's just finish with the first one. Option number one now is for us to basically continue into this complete self-disclosure to these platforms, hoping that they will be what previous attempts at providing some kind of welfare and free time by other means. You know, how did we get free time in the past? You know, you can think about it. There were trade unions, other actors who are going negotiating with bosses, whatnot. I mean, all of that is kind of swept aside with a few exceptions. I mean, you're lucky if you work in the German car industry, but you know, maybe even German car industry at this point is not the safest place given what we've recently learned. Um, so I mean, trade unions are no longer there to generate free time. Political parties of the left are no longer that interested. So we have this rhetoric of personal responsibility. And at the same time, we have these new actors coming from California very far away, basically making the speech. Let us monitor and financialize every aspect of your everyday living, and by monitoring and financializing it, uh, you know, we'll make some money, clearly, but we'll also be able to provide you with some services. Right? And I'm mostly focusing here on sort of advanced uh, welfare regimes of Western Europe. If you look at the rhetoric in places like uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, or Latin America, the situation is much worse. So you have Facebook recently forming an alliance called Internet.org with mobile operators, where they basically would step into a developing country and they would say, look, we'll offer you free internet. Forget about your government offering digital inclusion. Forget about all of that. We, Facebook, will offer you free internet. Right, and then you start reading the small print, and the small print, of course, is where all the dead bodies are buried. And what it basically says is that, well, they will offer you free access to Facebook. Everything else you'll have to pay for. So Facebook steps in, basically says, 
Facebook itself is free, Wikipedia is free, and a handful of other services is free. Everything else you have to pay for by traffic, which creates all sorts of distortions into how people access and use technology. Because suddenly, if you think about it, if you want to provide an educational service reaching people in Tanzania, right? What would you rather do? Would you rather create a standalone website where people can go and anonymously download video courses, audio courses, and study? Or would you rather just dump all of that on Facebook where people will be able to access it for free? Of course, you'll dump it all on Facebook, but if you think about it, that also creates an extra layer that wasn't previously before at all in the provision of the service, which is that suddenly now our ability to offer educational content presupposes a key intermediary, which is Facebook, because Facebook suddenly has the ability to collect the data about what students are studying, what uh, universities are offering, and so forth. Right? And this is how, by the slight manipulation of the market and the fact that governments, uh, for various political and historical reasons, are themselves no longer interested in providing the kind of digital inclusion that they might have embraced 15 or 20 years ago, they outsource that to Facebook, Facebook comes in, and offers services which do deliver some goods, right? And it's the same thing that I think we have to keep in mind about Google. It's not that they deliver nothing, and it's not that they deliver inferior services. It's just that they deliver services on terms that differ quite sharply from the kinds of alternative interventions that might have taken place if we were to approach an issue like digital inclusion or even health with a somewhat different, more political perspective, right? So uh, clearly, having you count how many steps you take and having you internalize this logic that all of the problems, health problems that you have are just the result of your own irresponsibility, it might generate and produce very healthy people. I mean, look at California. Yes, it's much less obese than the rest of America. But it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right thing to do from a political perspective, which is no longer a perspective that's available to most citizens, so we can't even analyze what on earth is happening. So just the fact that we can internalize a lot of guilt and make ourselves responsible for all of the problems in our lives and thus perhaps you know, gain an extra year or lose uh, you know, another kilo is in itself not an indicator of how would you like the world to run. Right? And this is where the political questions of how do you want to distribute responsibility for the problems that you face in your world actually arises, and we can talk about it a bit more. But let me briefly outline the second option because we'll, we'll run out of, out of time really soon. And the second option that Silicon Valley puts in front of us does not involve this data monopolies, and it involves a different set of commercial intermediaries, and it's smaller startups that want to take on Google and Facebook by arguing that basically they will be the ones who let us become entrepreneurs of our own data. And they want to encourage us, instead of dumping all this data on Google and Facebook, to collect it on our own, and then to put it on the market, and then to sell it to earn a living by letting other companies rent it. Right? So essentially, we are engaged to engage, we are encouraged to engage in self-surveillance of sorts, generate as much data as we can about ourselves, then put it in some kind of online world or online bank, you know, however you want to call it, where as other companies access the data, we'll be able to earn some data interest, thus making a living. Right? And that logic appeals also to quite a lot of people, in part because it actually channels some money from the likes of Google to actual citizens. Right? So there is much to be liked here, at least from the citizens' end, who might not have necessarily a lot of money uh, with the financial crisis, unemployment, and all of the other problems. But at the same time, you can clearly see how it opens you to the very same kind of exploitation, perhaps a much deeper exploitation, whereby you start thinking about every single thing that you do on a daily basis, every single social interaction that you have, every single conversation that you have, every single thing that you do uh, through the perspective and through the lens of profit and loss. Because you know that potentially every single conversation that you have, somebody might be interested in buying some aspect of knowledge about that conversation. You know, you go and sing a song in the shower in the morning. And I can assure you that there is a manufacturer of your shampoo who would like to know which song is it. 
Uh, and you know, if your uh, smartphone or sensor in your sh shower can organize an instantaneous auction the same way that Google organizes auctions for Google Ads and sell the data to the highest bidder for five cents, I can assure you that quite a lot of people will actually opt for that option, right? And you can think clearly how turning our entire life into a bank from which we can derive an extra interest will also lead to the kind of financialization of everyday life that I do not find particularly appealing from a political standpoint and not the technological standpoint. Right? And that basically uh, gives us a rather sad world with those two options. And for me, this is clearly not enough. And there is a need to be thinking about data in a more robust manner because I, I even didn't get close to talking about companies like Uber, but you can see in a company like Uber clearly where the value is. A company like Uber, according to the latest valuation just this week, is worth $70 billion, right? It's a company that doesn't own anything. They don't own the cars, they don't employ the drivers, right? And then the question is, where does the value come from, right? And uh, clearly, not all of it comes from the data, but it comes from somewhere, right? And it comes probably from the fact that now they are sc they've scaled so well, they have so much uh, presence globally, but a lot of it also has to do with the fact that there are other intangible resources and assets that companies like Uber are sitting on. And it's clear that the kind of infrastructures that, that they have put in front of us already at the level of the city will be very hard to rework and it will be very hard to uh, get rid of unless, of course, you see drastic interventions by cities and, um, uh, and uh, governments, which I would actually argue in the long run will not be very effective because currently they are mostly propelled by the interests of incumbent industries like the taxi industry in the case of Uber or the hotel industry in the case of Airbnb. And they do not necessarily talk the language of politics, justice, fairness, or anything that to me would actually mobilize the citizens. Ultimately, I think if citizens were to make a decision uh, whether they would like to use Uber or not, the fact that most of us now reason solely along the lines of cost and benefit would actually favor Uber. And this is the logic that these companies are exploiting. They're basically saying, well, you know, stick with Uber because ultimately you'll end up paying less. Right? And it's the same uh, demise of solidarity I've described before because we no longer understand why we have to pay more for inferior services. Because we think of those services like taxes as inferior because we do not even account for the fact that while a taxi company that is regulated has to train its drivers, for example, in how to handle blind people so that a blind customer would be put into the car with some care and instructions by the driver. And in the case of Uber, they are not trained in anything, so they wouldn't offer that service. So, of course, they can provide the service much cheaper. For those of us who are not blind, what difference does it make? Because we're not even thinking in those terms anymore, right? And there is a big sort of discussion, which I don't really have the time for now, to talk about the demise of solidarity, and I don't really want to go on talking too much about Uber, but I think the basic point here is this. If you want to build a healthy alternative to everything that Silicon Valley puts in front of us, including services like Uber, we have to figure out how we can pull the data from the citizens that will be generated with all of those gadgets and devices, which currently are also in the hands of Silicon Valley. So we need to have a multi-pronged strategy that will try to liberate the devices, the sensors, but also create an appropriate legal, political, and social regime for data ownership, whereby data can be something that will accrue to us, the citizens, but will not necessarily be something that we will be able to uh, buy and sell in the market. And I think this is perfectly a legitimate way to think about many uh, products. I don't want to call it products or commodities, but for the sake of, of simplicity, you know, that might be a best way to describe it. There are quite a lot of goods that we actually allow people to own and we treat them as owners without necessarily allowing them to engage in market transactions in it. And uh, I know it's a very provocative point to end, to end on, but I think this is something that will allow us to start building the kinds of highly decentralized technological services that will allow entire communities to organize themselves in a somewhat different manner. So the example I usually give in such cases is a service that was launched by the city of Helsinki uh, a year ago, together with the city, uh, together with the spin-off from the university. 
there. And basically what it does is that it tries to replicate Uber, but in a very different paradigm. So they allow people to place uh, requests by, you know, the smartphone. Uh, in the meantime, there is uh, a system somewhere in the cloud that matches uh, customers who would like to go in a similar direction. So instead of sending an individual car, you actually get a minibus which takes five, six, seven people who will be traveling along the same route because they have indicated it on their phone and they are dropped off as they go through that route and they end up paying three or four euros and not you know, 25 or 30 that they would pay for an Uber ride. Right? In the same time, the system does not have all of the ideological and economic baggage and, uh, and problems that Uber has with uh, poor employment practices of drivers, drivers no longer required to rank passengers, passengers are no longer required to rank drivers. I mean, even that, that you know, an aspect that a lot of people don't understand about companies like Uber, all this ranking, I mean, why is that ranking happening? Because it's a way to reduce transaction costs. Because if you can filter out people who have a ranking below four out of five, both in terms of drivers, in terms of customers, you probably are not likely to have uh, much by way of friction and you can thus minimize costs of people disrupting taxes or, or whatever. Right? But again, this is something that a private company would do because it makes sense. This is not necessarily something that we would expect from our public transportation system. Right? I don't know what is the criteria by which you know, my humor should be evaluated in the cab so that I arrive at a ranking four out of five because my jokes are not funny enough instead of, you know, 3.5 out of five. You know, like this is the kind of things that I think we have to rethink with the view of anonymity as an enabling condition. Because I think there is something to anonymity, not just in, you know, in your bus or in your car and whatever, but something about anonymity in general in the public out there that clearly enables a certain lifestyle and a certain ability to take risks that we are likely to lose as we move to a world full of sensors where our every behavior is being detected, analyzed, and optimized, and we have to only drink healthy exercise, you know, try to be funny or stay silent or whatnot. And there is a certain aspect here of anonymity that I think we never had to think through when we were designing you know, the welfare state for the sole reason that uh, the technological ability to detect and analyze everything was never there in the first place. Uh, but to get back to the example I've just given you with Finland and this service for providing people with uh, transportation services, you can also think about what kinds of uh, apps, uh, what kinds of services can be built not just by app developers or entrepreneurs, but who can actually be designed by entire cities, communities, uh, NGOs and activists as they have access to the data that's being generated about them. If you think about it, who can build apps and services on top of the data that Google currently is collecting? And I can tell you, the only answer here is Google. Google is the one building all the services on top of it. If they want to build a new feature in the search engine, they build it. If they don't, they don't. And you can clearly see how in many services, they're clearly under innovating. If you look at something like Google Scholar, which many of you in the university setting are probably using on a daily basis, to me it's obvious that this is a system that hasn't added a new useful feature in 12 years. Why? Because it, has, it makes zero money for Google. There is no money to be made from adding new features to Google Scholar. I know how to make it better. Can I add a feature to Google Scholar? No. Why? Because it's essentially a public good that's used by everybody, but it's a public good that's in the hands of Google and just the result of historical coincidence. Right? And I would like us to think of an option whereby the data that we generate, because ultimately it's the data that we generate that makes this company so powerful and be able to make all those predictions. Right? As I've said, when I send an email to somebody, it allows Google to establish that I'm related to this person or that person. And it's thanks to that data that they're able to create this complicated knowledge graphs about how everybody is connected to everybody. But this is data that already exists in society. So in some sense, you can say that they're just parasitic on social relationships that already exist. What I like us to think about is a model and a vision whereby we can create a pool of data that will be socially useful and based on which, on top, you will actually be able to build new services, apps, uh, and whatever other thing you would like to build for a city or community. Right? And I think it might not be the worst analogy for you to grasp what I have in mind. It, will be the wrong paradigm because I don't want it to be commercial, but think about Apple before 2007 or so. 
Apple before 2007 had a dictator in the name of Steve Jobs and he thought that he knew everything about the world, right? He thought that he knew exactly how every single app on your phone should look like and he knew exactly what you need to use your smartphone for. There was just no debate. He thought that you will do 15 things with your phone, here it is, those 15 things Apple will build for you and provide you for. What happens afterwards is that Apple does become a platform. So there is a change in logic and in mentality and Apple realizes that it can actually allow citizens and users, you, whatever, entrepreneurs to build new apps, integrate them and then those apps will do things that Apple itself could have never imagined. Right? And of course there are lots of problems with this vision and they're very still strict, they have a very prudish attitude and obscenity, ultimately it's a commercial company, commercial product, I don't want Google to become the new Apple when it comes to how they would run their data store. But I would like us to think of a way in which we'll actually be able to detect the fact that despite all of the rhetoric about innovation and welfare that companies like Google and Facebook are putting in front of us, they're actually systematically under innovating because they have no clue what they can do with that data or they don't have an incentive for it. On the other hand, if I live in a certain neighborhood and I know that I go to work every day on the same route and suddenly I have the ability to know that 15 of my neighbors go to the same route or go along a similar route, I don't necessarily know which ones because I don't want to violate the privacy, but suddenly I know it, right? Yes, we can suddenly start pulling our efforts together and organizing new services, new management, new administration, new buses, whatever. That presupposes the ability to compare notes, so to say. That presupposes the ability to see data and to be able to build a service that can actually be built, which I'm afraid will not be the case as our cities become captured by another set of intermediaries for whom I don't have the time today, which are offering various smart city solutions. Right? which in a sense is a way to make cities run on proprietary code that will be very impossible to think or monitor or look inside, that will become black boxes and you will have as much insight into how your city runs as you have into a Volkswagen. I mean, that unfortunately is the uh, possible future we will have at the level of the city and Google, Microsoft and others are increasingly active in this space as well, but mostly it's IBM, Cisco uh, and, and HP and a couple of German companies. But I think we have to keep this vision of a utopian world. And of course here, you know, I know that it's extremely utopian what I'm saying because given the current uh, problems we have with the security state, with surveillance and everything else, I mean, there is no way that our own governments will not abuse uh, that system. So, I mean, there are many provisions that will need to be put in place with regards to encryption, privacy and whatnot before anything like that can even be floated. And I'm even more sure that there will be no appetite for anything that does not revolve around the paradigm of private property, entrepreneurship and things like that at the level of European governments, let alone the European Commission. With all of that provisions, however, I still think that without having a robust, aggress aggressive, but also ambitious utopian vision for a world full of sensors, algorithms and data, we will never be able to offer any kind of alternative to the welfare that will be provided by Silicon Valley. I think I'll stop here and be more than happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Um, hello, my name is Daniele um, and I study artificial intelligence here at Maastricht University. I'm following you for many years and I'm really happy to, 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 <laughs> to have you here in my uni. I'm also a researcher in learning technologies and now researching how the heart rate uh, measure, uh, measured with a wearable wristband, I'm also wearing right now, uh, is a good predictor for learning and learning performance. Um, uh, you were speaking about the bias that predictive modeling has uh, because it's based on shallow causalities and probabilistic models that it relies. Um, but we learn in our school that uh, the value stands more than the prediction, more on the interpretations of these models. Uh, so given that the uh, Internet of Things is now a reality, self-driving cars are now in the streets and predictive modeling is all around, as you said. Uh, don't you think is, uh, besides the data policy that you were uh, mentioning uh, 
a, a renewed data policy. Don't you think that uh, we also need a new narrative which also talks about the positive applications of these uh, technologies and also um, and train people to give the right interpretation to these uh, predictions? Uh, don't you think that it's also um, talking also about only the risks can push the people, can be a bit counterproductive, uh, can push the people a bit mm -hmm. away of mm -hmm. this field that is really interesting and can be really helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. Um, I mean, look, I think that uh, you can uh, create space for different interpretations uh, if you're working on new media art. There are a lot of people working on art projects that, you know, if it shows you uh, your heart measurements and then it tells you, well, but think about Big Pharma, all these companies trying to push you drugs. I mean, fine, you can create a nice kind of art project and show it in some fancy art conference in Berlin and, you know, get a lot of applause. My fear is that none of those applications will ever go mainstream. So, you know, you can be content as an artist to be producing apps that will help people question reality. The actual uptake of those apps by the mainstream population will, uh, I'm afraid, not be uh, significant without involvement and support by powerful actors like governments who I think still have to be kept as part of the picture. The reason why so much in my remarks is negative because I'm actually trying to detect uh, not so much or criticize not so much the behavior of individual citizens. I can perfectly understand how in the absence of any alternative courses and paths of action as you know trade unions disintegrate, as political parties uh, turn themselves into some kind of a hybrid between the spectacle and the circus. Uh, you know, a lot of people are looking for solutions to get things done and fixed on the quick. And in those conditions, I don't want to moralize and uh, blame them for using Google Now or any of those technologies. At the same time, it shouldn't prevent me from offering a critique of what the governments are doing. And this is where it gets really uh, political. Because there is no reason why the European Commission should be dumping 99% of its money into apps that promote exactly this kind of individualistic, neoliberal, responsible agenda where individuals are encouraged to take responsibility into their own hands, and 1% into projects that operate according to different ideology. So the point here in, in much of my own critique and uh, intellectual interventions over the last few years has been to actually point the finger not just to Silicon Valley, but also to governments and to various international institutions, including the European Commission, without whose intervention this market wouldn't exist. So I think it's just irresponsible for us to keep continuing blaming these entrepreneurs wearing hoodies from Silicon Valley, where what they're trying to do in Europe is like, you listen to them, they want to create the largest digital single market in history, and they want to create uh, a world by signing the trade treaties where you'll have free flow of data across borders. I have no idea what it means. Like if by free flow of data across borders, which is what DTEIP wants to do, we mean that you know, any, any barrier that I erect in terms of where my data flows will be considered as a barrier to economic growth, then yeah, we, I think we are in deep trouble. Because by this logic, you know, any like the walls in my house are trade to economic growth because they prevent certain data from getting out of my apartment. So in that sense, yes, it's a barrier to economic growth, but I don't think why the only uh, benchmark and yardstick for debate in Europe should be the imperative of economic growth, which in any sense does not necessarily end up benefiting the citizens. So, I mean, this is the kind of perspective from which I come. And, you know, with some of the remarks at the end of my talk where I try to say that we need to preserve some kind of utopian potential and, 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 and kind of some kind of utopian hope for the deployment of those technologies, uh, I'm trying to show that they can be used for a very different uh, agenda. It's just that the background condition for that agenda to happen is political and economic change and above all in Europe. You cannot have apps or services that will promote an agenda that runs counter to the kind of neoliberal project we are building as we continue building the neoliberal project. People who believe that, to me, have lost any connection to reality, I'm afraid to say. Any more questions? 
Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Gloria. Uh, I guess I have a couple of questions, actually. Uh, so to begin with, my main problem with the welfare state, as proposed by Silicon Valley, is what is the value of human input? So considering, for example, that algorithms do better judgments in court than judges because they're, um, they don't have bias, and seeing that next Netflix knows better what I want to watch then, I know what I want to watch, and also with Google Now, what in your view is the value, what will be the value of our human experience of human input in decision making? Mm. Sure. And then also to your first part of your talk, where you talked about health and insurance and data. So for me, wouldn't you also think that's some sort of discrimination so that I get this health insurance or that health insurance because of my data? So in my view, it would be like, I have the right not to be discriminated against uh. because of my sex, of my gender, my sexual orientation, and also of my data, because what in the end is this data? It's not me. Sure, sure. Yeah, and then my last <laughs> question, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, my last question would go on the end of your talk uh, to ask you this change or this utopia, this new shift, should it come from us, the citizens, or does it need to come from the state? Because clearly, the rise of Silicon Valley as a welfare state was triggered by the fail mm. of the real welfare mm. state. So how, how to sure. solve that uh, problem? Um, so very, very quickly on all three. Uh, the first question, to what extent, um, you know, there is a recognition of some kind of ambiguity or edginess of human personality in this mechanistic algorithmistic systems. I, I think, uh, again, and that ties to my first, to response to the first question, I don't think that it's technolo technologically unfeasible to come up with a system that will allow you to grow critically, multidimensionally, experience different perspectives and see different things. It's just mostly commercially unviable. So, you know, it's not that, you know, it's very easy to build an algorithm that in addition to what you see on Amazon, people who like this book would like this book, you know, it's time to show people who like this book, hated this book. So maybe you should check out this book that other people hated. You know, it's just, there is no money to be made in such recommendations, except you can build, unless you can build a very niche service for people who really want to become critical thinkers. I mean, this is what universities were supposed to be about before they all, sort of got obsessed with training uh, next managers who will be employable and have transferable skills. I mean, the universities were places where people are supposed to think critically and develop this perspective. Um, that is no longer the case, and Silicon Valley here is not really an ally. So, I mean, all of the services you've mentioned, they don't pursue that objective for the sole reason that they're all driven by one goal, which is to sell you more stuff and consume more. I mean, in the case of Netflix, you get into a somewhat different area whereby perhaps they'll actually make more money if they help you develop a richer taste. So you'll be watching more films of more kinds that you did, but it's, it's a tricky area. So you know, many of them just stick to the safest, which is feeding you the same of the same. Uh, with regards to the second question about rights, I mean, you're absolutely correct. I mean, in Europe, this is how <laughs> society used to function. Yes, there are a lot of rights that are encoded in various frameworks. And I, mean, I try to talk, uh, I mean, read any of the communiques written by uh, the European Commission. I would challenge you to find any serious reflections on dignity, which is supposed to be one of the core European values and rights. It's just not there. I mean, they are obsessed about a very different set of objectives, which mostly have to do with the state of the economy and the state of entrepreneurship. They'll use the word disruption much more than the word dignity in whatever documents they're issuing recently. Right? So, I mean, yes, you have the courts trying to do something, but even the courts, with an exception of the European Court of Justice, they're not really doing their job, as far as I'm concerned. You look at the uh, rise of surveillance laws in Europe, I mean, yes, it's easy to kind of go on blaming America and NSA and all of that is justified. And, you know, the European Court of Justice correctly ruled on this matter a few weeks ago. But if you look at the current law that has been passed in France with regards to surveillance, it's as draconian as the law in America, perhaps even more so. 
And it, yet it has passed, some of the worst provisions of that law have passed the constitutional court in France. So, you know, for me, I would like us to keep talking about rights. It's just that I'm not sure that that's necessarily a viable framework even in Europe. Um, with regards to the last question about the state, I think here the situation is very bad. I mean, the, the only uh, rationale I can give you for even articulating the kinds of critique I have been articulating today is to allow people to see problems that Silicon Valley creates or helps resolve as part of a much larger repertoire or array of issues that anybody who's concerned with changing the situation in Europe politically has to tackle. So, you know, and, and here it can be either very abstract or very specific, but you know, if you're thinking that, you know, the main threat to Europe right now, and if you're coming from either the extreme left or the extreme right, and you think that the main challenge is the European Central Bank, maybe, but you also have to be able to account for these new actors which are emerging and have already emerged in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. So you, we need to have a much more holistic picture of fighting the political and economic agenda because there is no point in fighting only tiny bits and pieces of it. Like I understand that certain skill sets would push people to pursue very particular fights. So I can understand why Max Schrems, you know, the Austrian student who studied law, will go and fight Facebook in the courts. I don't think that, regardless of how that decision ultimately turns out, you know, and we've had some success in the ECG, I don't think that that presents a fundamental challenge to the kinds of problems I have been identifying today. Because it's not like, you know, we can suddenly say, fine, I will not be using Google because, hey, we have invested so much money into our libraries that our libraries will provide you with a fantastic, you know, search result tomorrow. That infrastructure is not there. So I'm afraid that Europe will continue with Silicon Valley as its kind of source of infrastructure. I mean, we can talk about other regions. You know, we can talk about Latin America, we can talk about Russia, China, where there are all sorts of other issues. But their dependence on Silicon Valley is somewhat less. We can argue whether it's good or bad, but it's clearly less. In Europe, the change has to be much broader and it has to side outside of technology. You have to understand technology today as the ultimate frontier of a much broader logic of neoliberalization that has been transforming all those other industries in Europe, health or sectors, health, education, uh, transform, uh, transportation and so on. This is the reason why Silicon Valley feels like such a natural ally because these domains themselves have been transformed to such an extent through privatization and other interventions as to make Silicon Valley into a perfect ally. So the state here can be a solution if you manage to capture it with the right ideological and political agenda. But, you know, make no mistake. I mean, we have seen the experience of Syriza. We have seen what has just happened in Portugal with uh, sort of left of center coalition being even banned from governing because they are asking critical questions about the euro. Uh, it's not going to be easy because the challenges are also at the European and global level. So, like, my, <laughs> my ability to tell you a positive story about the future of Europe and the ability to resolve all these problems at this point is rather minimal, I'm afraid. There was a question over here. Yeah. Hello, my name is Tamar. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm glad you ended on somewhat of a utopian note, though that was a bit undermined in the last response uh, because this story is quite bleak. Mm. Um, and I agree that it is quite bleak, but I still wonder if states are not the, the way to look uh, towards solutions. Uh, I'm thinking that hmm. these companies, Google and Facebook, are still companies, and it's still a commercial relationship that we have with them. Now, this commercial relationship is irrelevant if there's no possibility to opt out, and opting out um, requires alternatives, which we haven't developed yet, but also a certain understanding of what's going on. Now, I wonder if this understanding of what's going on, if there hasn't been um, an increase, uh, certainly since the Snowden revelations, of a kind of general understanding of the types of surveillance that are going on, if they're governmental or if they're corporations, if they're advertising, and um, if we can't expect a kind of backlash on the, on the, on the part of, sim of general populations, not hacker activists. Mm. 
but um, just people in general. I was going to mention Max Schrems, but I see that he doesn't. No, seem no, to I, do mean, he's the, I mean, again, I, I have no problem with Max Schrems. I think what he's doing is an important intervention. Just that it's an intervention at a level which almost denies the economic and historic origins of the problems that I'm articulating here. So, in this sense, how should I put it? I don't think that surveillance is necessarily, if, if I had to list three or four problems that I think are worth tackling with regards to technology, I don't think I'll put surveillance first. I'll probably st actually put privatization first before surveillance. And uh, with technological infrastructure, the story is a bit difficult because it's not like data was public and then it became privatized. It's just that we already started under a model where there are only private companies collecting it. So it's born privatized and it's very hard for us to imagine how it could have worked differently even though those of us with some experience with healthcare and educational models that were not run fully on the neoliberal logic can still remember what it was like. With uh, data, we can only think back to the libraries and for many people it's not a very meaningful uh, experience and engagement. That said, you know, I, I wish what you said was true and I think you know, I'll be I'll be eaten alive if I uh, criticize the, 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 the logic of ethical consumption in Holland. But I, I don't think that the solution lies in producing a kind of, you know, fair trade version of Google. Like, I don't think that producing services that will be free of this, um, you know, that will have perfect encryption at this point without the intervention of the state is just economically viable. You will end up commodifying things like privacy to an extent that will be even worse because you'll have to pay for those services. Like there is nobody in right now, I can assure you, like what, how much money you need to build a decentralized decrypt, encrypted email system. I can assure you a good one that will actually work, you need at least $500 million, uh, at least. Uh, this money has to come from somewhere and somebody will have to pay for it. You can solve that problem through capital markets. You go to venture capitalists, you raise the money, you pay for it. But then it means that users will be charged, which means that now you'll actually be creating even further distortions about people who have access to privacy and who don't because suddenly it will be mediated by the logic of the money. So you'll end up with people paying 10 or 15 euros a month for a more secure existence than not. And this is where for me, the logic of finance and economics here is much more, it gets you understand the issues much more than just the legalistic logic of detecting surveillance or not. Because if you do not start from the assumption that commodification of everything, including privacy, is a bad thing, you will not detect those changes. And I think that the problem with Europe, and you know, I, I'm in Europe every week. You know, like I spend far too much time in Europe. I know how tempting it is for a lot of people in Berlin to get together and build another app that will supposedly provide some kind of encrypted experience. They're just not tackling the problem at the root level. And the root level there does have to do with where would the money come from to pay for this stuff? Because they'll either end up with this art stuff that will be used by five people, or they will end up with stuff built by you know, Deutsche Telekom, which will not carry an American flag outside of it, will still be uh, available for German security service to monitor, and will also carry a price. And I don't want that outcome either. So again, as much as I would like to be upbeat, you cannot resolve this problem without massive uh, Inge injections of money from somewhere and ideally that would be taxpayers money that currently it's not like we don't have money for technology policy in the European Commission but check where that money goes it all goes to incumbent telecoms under the label of you know research and development because they can't offer officially state aid and go and look at where the money goes where the lobbyists go who decides whether I mean there are billions I look at horizon 2020 you know I've done my homework like this money is there well, the, the reason why that money does not go to fund the encrypted software that will be decentralized is because the political process is captured. And the only way to uncapture it is the kind of political interventions that I'm afraid uh, not a, a lot of people in Europe have uh, appetite for. Speaks the Belarusian in me. So. <laughs> right. Does anyone in the audience has another question? Over there. Thank you very much um, for your talk. 
of these two uh, options you described uh, in the Silicon Valley, one, one going for the monopoly and the other one going for the <coughs> decentralized um, startups, uh -huh. is it just like um, a way to simplify the reality or there are actually processes, lobbying activities, organized parts of the Silicon Valley who try to push either in Brussels or in Washington <coughs> for one or two, two outcomes? And given you, you seem to be really mm -hmm. <coughs> a lot, which is very interesting about Horizon 2020 in Brussels. Is it Brussels going one or the other direction or, or this attempt to try and uh -huh. bring Brussels in one or the other? Well, I mean, sorry, I'll be very cynical. I mean, uh, Brussels at this point seems to be uh, much more captured by European telecom companies rather than American ones. So much of the money goes to Deutsche Telekom, uh, Orange, and, you know, all of the big uh, European ones, in part because, or it goes to protect the interests of other incumbent industries in Europe that stand to be disrupted by Silicon Valley. So the companies setting the agenda in Brussels, and uh, sorry, like I'm, I have nothing against Germany, but they happen to be German uh, banks, German publishing companies, and German car companies, who are all scared of what's happening with Silicon Valley entering every one of those industries. And they're the ones who have the digital commissioner, who happens to be German now, and they're the ones who are setting much of the agenda in Europe. Uh, so I know, and that also clearly shows you what they think about uh, competition, what they think about ways in which uh, they can present Google as being a monopoly or not being a monopoly, you know, they would like to, you know, I personally, to be honest, actually think that data is something that lends itself to the status of national monopoly quite easily. I actually think it's better if when you're providing a service, you have access to as much data about the user as possible, because clearly when somebody is searching for a pizza, you would probably want to know where that person is, because the results will get more relevant. Which means that you could, Google actually has some logic to it as a monopoly. It's just that if I were to run that service, I wouldn't put a private company in charge of that monopoly. The logic you hear, for example, come out of uh, European Commission is that, oh no, ideally we have to break it up because Google is too powerful. So we need to have map companies working uh, separate from email companies, those working separate from search companies and so forth. And I think from the perspective of the user inefficiency, that's insane. It's great from the perspective of companies that want to tie the hands of Google. It's not the best option from the perspective of actually generating relevant results, which is not to say that I'm defending Google, which is to say that I'm defending uh, alternative ways of conceiving uh, the provision of uh, infrastructure and information that will not default to the model of you have a decentralized market with you know, 25 players providing 25 different services, which would be the default assumption made in the commission. But to uh, give you a more uh, direct response to what you've asked about whether there are organized efforts, I mean, yes, but very often you'll see the same venture capitalists standing behind uh, these efforts which are diverging to different directions because they're funding companies that are both pursuing the monopoly option and are pursuing the small kind of data vault and data safe option. So you'll really have to look at a case-by-case -case basis, but I can assure you that you know, in Silicon Valley, there will be people who've hedged their bets. Uh, and who also, I mean, I, I, just a small anecdote. Uh, a, few months, a few weeks ago, I went to New York, uh, long story, to meet a startup that was basically selling, was allowing users to sell their data. Right, so it will allow you to basically link your credit card, your social profile on Twitter, Facebook, and a lot of other services. They will allow you to link it to one platform, and then they will sell that data to third parties. Right, and I started talking to them because I was interested in how much money that would actually bring to users and so forth. And I discovered that they are the ones seeding that market. They are the ones paying for that data. So because they don't currently have enough customers, so they went and raised a bunch of millions from venture capitalists, and there is no market for this data, but they want to create an expectation in users that the data is valuable. So they're the ones who will give you 10 euros for access to your Facebook profile, even though the market doesn't currently want it, because they want you to start thinking about your data as something that has value in it. Right, but the fact that you know, it's actually the same venture capital is funding those startups that are also paying for the purchases of the data didn't register with me before. But uh, it's there. I mean, so there are organized efforts to do it. Legally, it doesn't necessarily play out because 
right now there are yet not efforts to ban it so many of the legal players and policy players do not necessarily yet enter the picture but they will sooner or later i believe i saw a hand over here this will be the last question um, yeah, hi, thank you. Um, perhaps a bit more simple question, uh, but that's purely because my knowledge of information technology is not very abundant. Um, but I was wondering if it's actually also possible to um, be empowered to delete information which you put on Facebook or Google or any kind of other um, uh, website. Uh, and if there's actually a legal system which empowers you to do this uh, within mm -hmm. Europe or the United States. Sure. Uh, and if it's also in a TTIP uh, exchange. Uh, I mean, look, uh, part of this is what the Max Schrems case was about, right? That's uh, figuring out how much data these companies keep on us because there is no way you'll be able to delete it unless you actually know how much data Facebook has on you. So you might think that you'll just go and delete your post while there is a whole bunch of metadata attached to it that you will not be able to delete because it doesn't even know that it exists. And I would argue that probably the vast majority of the data that we generate is of that kind. So you don't have the ability to delete it right uh on the other hand i mean again this is where i'm kind of getting into my political mode uh, the incentives that we get from insurance companies health companies you know you name it all of these new intermediaries that pop up they actively discourage deleting because they want to get a very accurate picture of what we are and what we do so while i do not doubt that deletion will be available as a mode of action, as a mode of protest, it will be something for which you would pay a fee or pay a price. I mean, it's like, you know, you don't have to turn off your light in your house. You can keep it on even when you leave and then you'll pay for it. So, you know, it'll be the same. I'm not arguing that the normative value here is the same, but it will be something you can engage in, but you'll have to pay a price. And that has to do with the kind of process of commodification of everything that I was describing before. Um, more broadly, I, you know, there are these people arguing that we need to have what they would call Google jamming. And that's this idea, you know, where search, uh, search uh, engine jamming, where you would go and search for all sorts of unrelated information just to confuse the NSA, you know, to confuse Google so that they will not be able to have an accurate picture of you. There is an entire extension to your browser which you can install, which will append, uh, I think, 200 keywords on the NSA's watch list uh, to the end of your email, just so that uh, you will confuse the NSA by giving them false leads. I mean, again, as an art project, I think it, 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 it serves this function. Uh, more broadly, I, I think, it, it, to me, it kind of degrades politics even further because I don't think that this is how, like, I don't think that it's actually a dignified way of us going about solving that issue. Just like I don't like people who are currently, you know, making uh, kind of masks and umbrellas that will help you to defend yourself from facial recognition software that's out in the streets. Like, I don't want to wear a mask not to be recognized by facial recognition software. It, I mean, some people might internalize that logic just like they're more than happy to use self-tracking tools to, you know, deal with their health issues. And this is, I think, one of the more important things I'm trying to communicate today is that like there is no limit as to how much crap, quote unquote, we can accustom ourselves to, right? Especially when the other options are, are missing and lacking. It's just that there is no reason why we should do that unthinkably, right? And I think we have to challenge those ideologies and we have to also think of alternative, more ambitious way, ways to do politics. And uh, I know that it might sound currently impossible in Europe, but unless we specify and flag technology as an issue that is key to a dignified and uh, reasonable welfare policy in the future, we will not be able to resolve any of the issues, even if we address other issues that currently have been flagged, be that, you know, the democratization of the Eurozone or something else. Like, unless technology is on that agenda, I think, you know, the rest of the agenda wouldn't make much sense. Thank you so much.